about $24,500 each. Come on. Hey, what's up, y'all? Joe McCall, your homeboy here. Glad you're here. I got a special guest today on this episode of the Real Estate Investing Mastery Podcast. We are going to be interviewing my business partner, Matt Bills, who is from St. Louis. And we've been doing deals for a long time. He got started kind of doing houses. Now we're doing a bunch of land deals together. And we're going to be talking about the biggest mistakes to avoid when buying land. In other words, don't buy this land, buy this land. Uh, don't buy a land that has this and don't buy land that has that. And then we're going to be sharing with you just tips to sell your land really, really quickly. So if you're new here, if you're new and uh, you'd like more information on how to flip vacant land, I'd suggest you start with just getting my contract, simplelandcontract.com. It's the same contracts that we use for our land deals. When we buy them, if you want to check it out, go to simplelandcontract.com. Give us your name and email. And then I'm going to send you an invite to watch a class that teaches you how to use that contract. So go to simplelandcontract.com to check that out. Let's bring Matt on. Matt, how are you, man? Doing great. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me. Um, all right. So we're going to be talking about land today. Um, love, 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 vacant land. Uh, Matt, yep. just real quick, give people a little context. Um, we got a deal right now we're working on. Maybe I, I should have asked you this before we went live. Sure. Um, the, the issue we had with the seller and the L LLCs, I think you said the other day, that's close to being resolved, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's finally resolved. And what we're doing an assignment on these deals, right? That's right. And what is the assignment fee on these deals? There's two of them. So there's two lots. And the, the thing with these lots is they had a lot of back taxes. So they basically, they had a problem. And what you'll find in this business is if you can be a problem solver, a lot of times, now certain problems you don't want to solve. And you have to, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. But <laughs> if you can solve some problems, really good. Uh, they can reward you yeah. greatly. Okay. So in this case, it had some back taxes, but the seller was willing to let it go for a great price. So we were willing to take on that problem and solve it. Now we encountered another problem being that his LLC was uh, not active. Yeah. The, the LLC that owned the actual properties, yeah. therefore he couldn't actually sell them. Yeah. And he, it, it was a very complicated process that shouldn't have been, but long story short, uh, he got them activated in the right state. That was the situation. Uh, they moved from California to Utah. Yeah. And then these deals, the assignment fee on each of the properties is about $24,500 each. Come on. Okay. So come on. And and so the way it worked out was really amazing. If it wasn't for the LLC issue, um, we had a buyer that stepped in and wanted to just step in and have us assign it to him. So we actually never even... Yeah. Or, or we're not even going to buy them. We're just going yeah. to collect that assignment fee. We we could if we wanted we to, could. right? But like assignments are great. Now, sometimes assignments are harder to do with vacant land. And talk about this a little bit real quick. I, I'm getting ahead of ourselves, but I just, I wanted to give some context to this thing because these are two, like normally with houses, man, you can do assignments all day long. They're easier to do assignments with houses. Mm -hmm. With land, when the assignment fee is two or three times what we're paying for the property, yeah. It's a little yeah. harder to do, right? Like, um, right. So, but we we found a, the the buyer is an investor himself. We're selling it yeah. to him at a good deal. It's a really good price that he's getting it for. And that's why I think it's he's okay with yeah. it because he's an agent in the area and he knows that the price that we're selling it to him, there's still room on top for him to either turn around and sell it or hold it and wait for the market to turn around and then make an even nicer profit. Yeah. So, and 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 this yeah. is really key and important. Uh, this is something Matt and I have been learning uh, is, is you, you want to be in areas where there's high demand, isn't it? Yes. It's so much easier to sell properties when there's a bunch of them already being sold, right? Yes. Yes. And it's easier to find comps and know yeah. if you're making a good offer yeah. because when there's not a lot of volume there, it's very difficult. I mean, you might find a crazy spread of what you think yeah. your offer should be and you, you just don't. Yeah, it's helpful to have a lot of volume on yeah. both sides of it, buying and selling. I do this thing, Matt, called open office hours where um, for my students and they can come and submit deals for me to look at, right? And they yeah. always give me the hardest ones. Like, just please give me the easy ones. <laughs> but they give me the hard one. You know why they're hard? Yeah. Because they didn't, not, not all of them, but sometimes like they don't do what I teach and they go into areas that they like because they've been there before. Right. Or it's a nice area right. and they would love to own land out there. 
but there's no comps or very few comps. Yes. So now I'm looking at a property and I see something for 50, one for 150, $150,000. Yes. Like, what it's do tough. I do? And, and so this is why also I want to bring this up. And I know I'm sorry we're getting ahead of each other uh, on this, but um, this is what we've been working with realtors more and more. Right. Because a local realtor can help with telling you, yeah, this is a good area, not a good area. This is in the backyard. You know, this yeah. is in the area. They can help with pictures. They can help coordinate the showings and they can get it on the MLS, which means what? More eyeballs, right? Yes. Bigger buying pool. Yeah. Exactly. Um, all right, cool. He's Matt's got a cool presentation to share. And uh, we're going to talk first about things to avoid. And you ready? You right. want to share this? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's go ahead. All right. So yeah, like Joe said, we're going to talk about the things to avoid. And I'll preface it by saying these aren't in any particular order. So these aren't, it's not like number one is the biggest thing to avoid. I just wanted to get together a good list of things that will put you uh, having a much higher chance of success if you avoid these things. And just having the basic knowledge of them is really going to help you. And this is all learned from experience. School of hard knocks, things that we learned along the way. Uh, and, and I'm constantly learning new things to avoid, even in the business. And we've been doing it like eight years now, something like that, seven, eight years. So, yeah. so we'll just go ahead. The very first thing that you want to find out is, is the property landlocked? And you want to know if it's accessible. So is there road access to the property? Because again, remember how Joe mentioned getting on the MLS gets more eyeballs on it. Well, having a property that you can't get to, it really limits the buying pool. And in most cases, you're going to want to avoid that. So if it does have a road, the next thing you want to know is, is it a private road or a county road? And the, there are a couple of reasons you want to know that. And the first thing is if it's a private road, sometimes people will throw a gate up on the road and they'll put a, they'll lock it. And the problem with that is you don't know who owns the key to that gate. So you have this great property, but it now, even though it has a road, you can't get to it because you don't know who owns the, the lock, the key to the lock for that gate. So you send your photographer out there or even worse, a per, uh, prospective buyer out there and they just can't even get to it. And so you need to figure, figure that out first. And then secondly, because it's a privately owned road, maybe the people haven't maintained it because the owners of those properties and keep in mind in rural areas, they, they often don't even live there. They're out of state owners. And maybe there's a big washout in the road that might make it impassable or or hard to actually access. So those are things you want to think about. Again, who has the key? And then if it's landlocked, maybe it has a right of way. So you can check if it has a legal right of way. You can find that out usually on the deed to the property, or it might be a separate recorded document at the recorder's office. But you should check that out first uh, because then all of a sudden now you have a piece of land that you could probably sell as long as it's not too complicated. So those are the, the things to deal with a landlocked property. The next thing would be, does it have an HOA? And Joe, feel free to jump in if I'm Most if uh, you feel like I'm missing anything. Most okay, good. okay, cool. So 99% of the time, Joe and I are going to pass on these. And, and the reason is just from experience. We found that in talking about rural land, because these little info lots are a little bit different, but on rural land, the reason people are buying that in most cases is to get away from rules and regulations. So uh, it really limits the buying pool. Again, if you have a piece of land that has all these CCNRs on it that just make it like you can't even cut the grass at a certain length or whatever it is without a fine. So uh, if it's a really desirable property, sometimes we'll overlook it. Okay. So that 1%. So you want to ask yourself, how restrictive is it? Yeah. You know, is it 40 pages of CCNRs or is it just one page and it's not a big deal and you can overlook it? Yeah. Okay. And then also, how much are the fees? Is it an HOA that costs $200 a year or $1,000 a year? And again, all these things are going to add up to make it either more desirable or less desirable to someone wanting to buy it. So, and then if, if the, if it does have an HOA, are there fees current? Because sometimes they never paid them. Like we were uh, trying to buy a lot in Texas that was a part of an HOA that we weren't aware of. We go to the closing table and it had $4,000 of HOA back fees. So not back taxes, HOA back fees. Um, and those have to be brought current. So they, they transfer with the property. So yeah. you just need to be aware of that. And then maybe, are there any sold comps in the past three months? So are people buying these HOA lots? You want to see recently within the past three months, are they moving? Okay. Cause that's also going to tell you and give you some feedback if it's a desirable property or not. So the next thing, number three is terrain. So is the property sloped, rolling or flat? And keep in mind that each of these are good and bad, depending on who's buying it, right? Because people want to do different things with the land. So the very first question you want to ask is, is the land buildable? Because most people want to buy land 
to build on it, or at least to have the option to build. Now, again, there are outliers. Some people want to, to buy a piece of land. Maybe they want to put a, a dirt bike track on it. You know, so they're, they're not interested in a building. Maybe they want to camp on it. Maybe they want, um, they go rattlesnake hunting in, in the desert in Arizona. Who knows what they want to do with it, but probably by and large, people want to know that it's buildable because that increases the value of the land. And if it is, let's say it's sloped um, very badly, you know, how can you use the terrain to your advantage? Mm -hmm. If there's a buildable spot on the top of that slope, well, now your piece of land isn't just a worthless slope piece of land. Now you have mountaintop, yeah. like top of the world views. Yeah. That's your advertising angle. Yeah. Okay. Keep on so, going, Matt. I have to get something to drink real quick. Keep on going. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. So you're just trying to think to yourself, you know, even if it's rolling or flat or sloped, how can you use that to your advantage? And I just threw this picture in here for fun because this is a crazy sloped property and 99.9% .9 of the people are not going to build a house like this into the hill. And I don't even know if that's real, but just to, to prove the point there um, of how terrain matters, most of the time, this, this piece of land right there is not sellable. Okay. That leads us to the next thing, which would be attributes. You know, does it have any unique attributes? Is there a stream or a spring on the property? You know, are there stunning views? Does it have easy access? Are there already utilities? Is there electric there? Is there already a water tap that's there or a well in place? So you want to be thinking to yourself, what things make this lot different than all the other lots that would make it worth more money to me when I buy it? Okay. Is it near maybe uh, like a national park, some kind of attraction that people would be interested in? Those are all things you want to keep in mind. So the more attributes that I have that make it different, the more valuable it's going to be and the easier it's going to be for you to sell it. Okay. So number five is going to be taxes. And very simply, you just want to find out, you know, are the taxes current and how much is owed? If they owe taxes, how much is it? And then you're going to use that. And let's say they had, they owe $2,000 in back taxes. Well, no problem as long as they're willing to accept that, right? So you'd go back and renegotiate. This is your power to go back and renegotiate and say, Hey, Mr. Seller, and Mrs. Seller, I see that you have these $2,000 in back taxes. You know, my offer was this, but now, unfortunately, it's going to have to be this, less the $2,000 or whatever it is that you think you can do for the property. Okay. The next thing, number six, is ownership. And although this seems simple, this is something you have to check out. You know, who is the legal owner of record or owners of record? You know, you need to figure out if they're alive still. And do they have the legal right to sell the land? Because what happens is, in a lot of cases, the parent, let's say the parents own a piece of land and they pass away, and then the kids start paying the taxes on on the lots. And what will happen is the tax office, it'll say the parent's name, maybe Jane Smith, and it'll say in care of, and it'll say the kid's name. So the kid thinks that they own the lot and they are trying to sell it to you, but it never went through the proper estate process when the parents passed away. So the kids, they actually don't own it. And they don't even know that because they think they own it because they're paying taxes on it. Mm -hmm. So you just want to be aware of that snag up. You don't want to get way down the line and then figure out that they can't even sell it to you. That's something you can figure out right in the beginning with a call to the assessor's office to just figure out who actually owns the lot. And then uh, some other thing to avoid would be partial ownership problems because particularly in Texas is like the worst culprit. Uh, Texas does things in the family and sometimes the family families can be big. So the parents might... <laughs> pass down a, a 10 acre lot to 20 kids or 20 uh, cousins and three of them aren't alive and you know all this different stuff. So now you need 20 signatures on a lot that you thought you needed one and it can be a big mess. So Texas is kind of the big culprit I've encountered that problem with, but just check to make sure they own a hundred percent of it is the point. Yeah. Okay. Next would be acreage. And in general, just as you would think, the larger the acreage, the better. So when you're planning out what you want to make, because most likely and probably you have a plan with what you want to make and what, what you're wanting to accomplish with your land business, uh, how much money you want to make per month or per year. And so will the acreage that you're going after, that you're mailing, that you're targeting, provide the results that you want? So, you know, do you want to do a hundred small deals for like little tiny um, rural quarter acre lots, not infill lots, but like ones out like in uh, Southern Colorado, that's just you know, th there are hundreds and hundreds of them that are identical with nothing to distinguish them. Or do you want to do five larger deals to get the same results? So those are the questions you want to ask yourself when you're picking your county and you're mailing to the certain lot sizes that you're mailing to. And <clears throat> number eight is wetlands. So this is an interesting one. And yeah. where we really ran into this one was in Florida. So 99% of the time, again, 
uh, we're going to pass on a wetlands property. Uh, they, they come with a lot of problems. A lot of times that, that means water comes up over the roads. Maybe the roads are impassable and there's a lot of standing water on the lots. And there's a lot of restrictions on wetlands properties because usually yeah. that, that also ties in with like uh, conservation laws uh, with animal protection and all kinds of different stuff like that. So um, buying wetlands will limit your buying pool significantly. Again, you, you want to buy property that has a lot of people interested in it. And this most of the time can be a big problem. So you want to check and make sure it's not in a wetlands area. Okay. So that kind of brings us into flood zones, which is uh, very close to wetlands, but you want to make sure is the property in a flood zone. Now, Joe can tell you in a test that in Florida, almost the whole state's in a flood zone of some kind, but not all flood zones are equal. So you need to figure out there's different levels and degrees of flood zones. And for the most part, most people in Florida are used to that, but it might mean that they may they may need a certain type of uh, flood insurance that might cost more. Um, and it may be harder to sell if it's in a really bad flood zone. It may have to be built on stilts or something like that. So you can go to the FEMA site uh, that I have up here, and maybe Joe could put it, link it in the show notes or something. Um, that will help you check quickly whether what flood zone that property is in. You just put in the property address and you can check it that way. Yeah. Um, yes. So then we're getting close to the end here of this section, but wildlife restrictions is another new one. And this, this is a crazy one, but you know, you need to figure out, is there a wildlife restriction in the area of the property that you're buying, you know, and what would buyers have to do in order to build there? Because in a lot of cases, uh, again, in Florida, we run into a situation where there's a protected bird called a scrub jay. And if you buy a lot in the scrub jay area, you have to pay a $5,000 fee to be able to build a home there. That's just a fee that they collect to get you a, a permit. Now it's a one-time fee, but you just need to factor that in that that might be a big turnoff for a lot of people. And not only that, you can't build in the entire springtime because that's the bird's nesting season. So there are a lot of crazy stuff and, and even crazier. There's a tortoise that if these certain tortoises are on your land, you have to pay $6,000 per tortoise to pick them up and have them relocated, which I think is crazy, but that, that, that right. happens. That's I, I, I want to say this to some of you guys who are newer to this business, you're listening to this thinking, oh my gosh, what, what can I buy? Like this, here's the thing. This is why we have three months to close <clears throat> on our deals. Right? Cause yes. we don't know. And there's so much you don't know when you're coming into land, just like with houses, you don't know what's behind the walls, right? Well, it's kind of the, right. thing of this, the same thing. So this is why we have three months for due diligence when we get a property under contract. So we can either go back, if we find one of these things, we can go back to the seller, renegotiate a lower price or cancel the contract. Or we may say, listen, yeah. um, if this is the lowest price that you can go, we don't think we're going to buy it, but we may be able to find somebody else who would. And so here it will give them an option agreement, you know, maybe a six month option right. agreement or something. Or we may just say, listen, this, we thought this might be a good deal because of this, the flood zones or the, you know, whatever. Um, here's a list of five realtors that you can call. So yeah, don't let this freak you out. Like, oh my gosh, there's so much here that could go wrong. We're talking about everything right. that could go wrong, but doesn't mean this happens all the time. Right. And I'm glad you brought that up because definitely don't be scared away by this. This is just uh, knowledge to have in your head when you're making offers and you're looking at, at your land that you're about to buy. Just keep this in mind. And like Joe said, a lot of it, like we learned inside of deals, basically, while we were doing our due diligence. Yeah. So you can always pivot and adjust and problem solve, like he said, whether you do an option agreement or renegotiate or cancel. So, you know, this is just to help you along the way, you know, to try to put something in your mind that if you see one of these pitfalls, well, maybe you can avoid them. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So... Again, you can ask a local realtor in the area if there are any wildlife restrictions. If you're concerned about that, they'll probably know or point you to a website that has, um, you know, it laid out on a map where you can easily see those kind of things. Okay, and then number eleven would be deed restrictions. And just because it's not a part of an HOA, a lot of times in some states they have deed restrictions. So you just need to check that out. You need to, you need to find out how restrictive they are, and you might need to get a copy of the deed to verify what those are. So uh, some states have this, some states don't. So you just need to check that out. Uh, number 12 is to call a realtor. It's kind of what we already talked about, but you want to make sure that you're, 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 you're right about the price that you think the land could sell for. So that's your main objective in calling the realtor. 
you know, I like to use Redfin and Land.com to find a realtor that has sold property near the property I'm looking at within the last three months. Now, Land.com is good about showing the listing agent's information. Sometimes Redfin shows it. Sometimes it only shows the Redfin general agent. But what you're looking for is someone who's sold a lot of land and even recently right near the land that you're looking to buy. Okay. So I use land.com mostly to find that you tell them you're buying a bunch of land in the County and you're looking for a realtor to possibly work with when you go to sell the property. So you ask them, what price do I need to be at to sell this land at 30 to 60 days or less? So you want to know not what's the top dollar you can get. You want to know, you know, to move it quickly, what price, do I, how low do I need to be? And that's the price you're going to try to, you know, factor in your buying price off of. So you're going to tell them you're calling a few other realtors as well. And if you can help them, that would be amazing because you got to make sure you're buying it at the right price in order to be able to use them to sell it. So you're not promising them anything. You told them you're, you're calling several realtors, but you're also letting them know they're not just doing you a favor. Like you, you want to be able to use them in the future. So you're trying to establish a relationship there and hoping that they can kind of get you that information quickly. And I should say too, like you, you need to, don't be afraid to be overly generous to realtors. So some people freak out like, Oh my yeah, gosh, good. I'm going to pay 10%. I normally pay 5%. Well, you're, we're yeah. also dealing with smaller price properties, but you, the realtors pay for themselves. It's very important. I think you can't, you yep. can't afford not to hire a realtor to list your properties. You're going to get a higher price for it. You're mm -hmm. going to sell it faster. You're going to do more of them. You're going to get somebody that can help with the pictures, can take the calls, can get it on the MLS yep. to get more eyeballs on it. So it's just worth it. Okay. Yeah. Especially if you're looking to scale, you start adding, you know, five, 10, 15 properties, you're taking all those calls in. It's going to be hard to actually do your other job of yeah. acquiring more properties. Yeah. And, and who um, pays the know. realtor? The, yeah. the buyers do really kind of yeah. the person bringing the money. So right. like it, and they, and they only get paid if they bring you a buyer. It's yeah. Not like you're, and you factor that in Yeah, your buying price. It's not like you're stroking a check to pay the realtor right. $2,000 or whatever. It, it comes out of the proceeds. So just make sure you factor that into your pricing. Okay, good. Go ahead. Yeah. So if, if it's cool with you, if you don't have anything else to add, I was going to transition over yeah. to how you sell your land fast. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So number one, just like you would think, uh, is be the cheapest. Yeah. So you want to be the cheapest on the market. At least that's our strategy. It's worked well for us. You know, so if, if I go and I look at, if I have a one acre property and I go and I look at all the four sales right there, let's say 15,000 is the lowest. Well, maybe I want to list my property at 14,000 or 14,500. You just want to be right under what's going on in the market. Yeah. And that's just going to give you a competitive edge because you're not looking to hold these properties. You want to move them in 30 to 60 days yeah. as quick as you can. And another thing you can do is you can pre-list your property and wait for market feedback. So the contracts that we use um, that Joe has inside of his class give you the legal right to market to pre-market the property uh, before you actually close on it. So a lot of times we'll do this and that allows you to have the market tell you if what you're thinking is correct. So you know you put you list your property and if you're getting nothing, if you're getting crickets, then you might be wrong about what you thought you could get for the property. So you're going to quickly lower the price and then lower the price until you start getting some consistent leads coming in. And that'll tell you that you're in the right area, at least in my experience. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to lower your price to hit the sweet spot. Um, okay. Next would be great pictures. Now, if you use a realtor, they're going to get the pictures for you. So that, that piece will be taken care of. But uh, if you're not using a realtor, it's worth it to spend the money to get great photos. It doesn't take much to stand out from the competition. I think I have a couple examples here, but um, if you are getting photos taken, I've had a really good experience using thumbtack.com to find photographers. Now you can find uh, a lot of different jobs that are fulfilled on thumbtack, but if you just go to, I think real estate photographers and look for uh, ones in your area near your property. And I, so far I've had a great success. And sometimes I've, I've paid between a hundred and $200 per property. That's for, photos on the ground and aerial shots. Yeah. So, and it's worth it. So, um, and then also they can be your boots on the ground. So this is another thing. Um, I'll often try to ask them to give me a report on the land because they're my people that have actually set foot on it. Remember we're doing this all remotely. So they're there and maybe they could tell me, yeah, the road was really great. It was easy to find, or there was this, this big washout on the road that was tough. Like, I don't know if, you had, if I didn't have a four wheel drive vehicle, I wouldn't have made it. Or um, maybe they're walking the property and they find a spring on it. 
you know, who knows? They might find something amazing or something bad. Maybe the neighbor has a junk pile that you do, you couldn't see on Google Earth. This this massive thing that would make it no one would want it. Um, so ask them. So some of that will be revealed in the photos, but ask them if anything stands out if if they found anything while they were going to it, how the road access was, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, yes. So then here's your competition, right? This is like now this is an infill lot. Uh, picture, but most of of the real estate lots you're going to see on Redfin and, and Lands.com, yeah. it look like this. Okay, so you need to stand out from this. Your job is to be different. So what which lot are you going to go to? The lot that looks like the left one or the right one? And just a little bit, like remember, uh, I've heard the saying that uh, real estate with a vision is worth more than than one without a vision. So you're trying to give them through your photos, through your description of what you're putting on your ads. You're giving them a vision of what they could do with the land, what it would be like to own it. Um, anything you could do, you need to do that work for them. People don't want to think for themselves. So your pictures are a good way to do that. Yeah, it's so important. Yeah. And then listing on multiple sites. So we talked about this already, but you want to get it out to as many eyeballs as you possibly can. So you're going to put it on your website if you have one. You're going to put it on sites that we use a lot is land.com, landmoto.com, landflips.com. We put it on the MLS and Facebook Marketplace, and there's probably other ones, but these are the main ones that we use to get it out there. What do you well, go back to that if you don't mind? What do you feel yes. like is um, gets the best leads, and which ones gets the worst leads? Um, I would say the MLS and Land.com have been giving us the most consistent leads, and we have had some. Uh, I mean, we have leads coming in from Land Moto and Land Flips, but they're not as consistent as the other two. And Marketplace is uh, mostly like tire kickers, to be honest. But it's still not a, a, an area you should ignore. I, I think you yeah. still should put stuff out there. We've sold a couple properties just from Marketplace. From uh, we had a buyer from Marketplace, but. Um, by and large, it's a lot of looky lose and people not super serious. Facebook Marketplace is frustrating because it's, sometimes your ads get or your properties get pulled down. Um, yeah, it it is a lot of looky lose. You should still do it, but yes, sometimes again, it's you get what you pay for, and it's important if you once you've done a few mm -hmm. deals, maybe you don't have to go get a big because it's not cheap to advertise on Land.com, right. Um, but it is worth it and, and you should if you can. And one other thing too, when you're looking for a realtor, find a realtor who's already paying for the sponsored listings on land.com, right? That's true. That's a good point. Because then they can put it there. And when you talk to them, ask them, yeah, are you going to put this on your, because sometimes they only have like a certain number of properties they can put on there. Yeah. Um, so ask them, can you put this property on the land.com websites? Yeah, that's a great point because yeah, that same yeah. company basically owns. Yeah. You should that's also good. add on their Facebook groups are a good place to go as well oh, yeah. to put uh, your properties on Facebook groups. Craigslist is another one, but again, you get what you pay yeah. for. So it's worth the extra money, but there's a lot of active Facebook groups where you can, um, yeah. you know, especially depending on who you're selling them to. Right. Um, but yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, like Joe said, I mean, if you don't have the capital to have all these subscriptions, use what you have, right? So use the Facebook marketplace and the groups and Craigslist. I mean, that's what we did when we first started out. We were using Craigslist. Um, you know, I guess we stopped, we stopped doing Craigslist, but uh, that's still a viable option. Um, so yeah, just use what you have. Don't let anything deter you, right? You just have this determined attitude. If you don't have a website, use a, uh, a like a, a Google spreadsheet to keep track of your properties. You know, we, we, we hear people doing that. So don't let anything stop you. Okay, so the next thing to sell it quickly would be neighbor letters. So you're going to send a letter to the neighbors offering them a first chance to buy the land. You're going to give them what we call a neighbor discount. So let's say you, you bought a piece of property, you think it's worth $36,000. You're going to send a letter to all the surrounding neighbors of that property and say, hey, we just bought this land. We're going to give you the first chance. You know, you're going to paint the picture that they don't want an obnoxious person moving next to them, but they have this opportunity to buy it at this neighbor discount. Maybe you offer it to them at $32,000 or $34,000, whatever you decide. And a lot of times you can quickly make a sale just like that without even doing any marketing, without doing listing on any site. You know, So that can, that can happen. And sometimes that can be your solution if the property is landlocked. So if you encounter a deal 
that that you think is amazing. It's a piece of property. Like we had this property. I told the class when I talked when I was talking at Joe's workshop, we had a property that was twenty acres in North Carolina. I knew that property was worth probably eighty to a hundred thousand dollars, but it was landlocked. Now it was one one property removed from the road. So my thinking was, okay, maybe I could. This is maybe this is a problem that's worth solving because I think I had it under a contract for eighteen thousand, something like that. So I went around and I sent neighbor letters trying to get any of them interested in the property. And I was very close with one of the neighbors and I was, someone told me there was a logging road access to the land, some old like cart road that gave legal access. I couldn't quite put those pieces together. And ultimately that neighbor fell through and he didn't buy it and we had to pass on it. But that could have worked out. That could, that could have worked out for us where we just sold it to a neighbor all of a sudden, even if we sold it to him for $60,000, he got a great deal. We got a killer deal. So you know, if you want to, if you're willing to problem solve on a great piece of land, maybe a neighbor letter can help you do that. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah. So then, uh, realtor, we already talked about on the selling side. You know, they're going to give you access to more buyers. The realtor is going to handle all the leads, so that's going to take a big workload off of you. And then you just factor their commission into the purchase price when you're buying it, so that it's not really. It's like, okay, cool. That's already taken care of. You're expecting for that to happen. And if you don't have enough profit margin. You can use what's called a flat fee listing agent to list on the MLS. And this can usually be done for a couple hundred dollars. So what, what they do is they're not representing you, but they're going to take your property and they're going to list it on the MLS for you. So it's going to still get that same access to all those buyers, but then the leads are going to come to you and you're going to handle all the leads. So it's kind of an interesting way to, you know, maybe you don't have a big enough profit margin in there to pay a realtor but you can pay a couple hundred bucks and you can still get all those eyeballs and then handle all the leads yourself. So we've done that as well. I was just talking about this uh, on a podcast recently. If if you're in an if you're trying to sell some vacant land for five grand. Yeah. Yeah. You're not going to have enough room yeah. to pay a realtor. And so you got to be thinking about that when you're looking into what markets you're going into, right? Maybe mm -hmm. don't target the areas where they're selling land for 5,000 bucks. Or don't target those right. size lots. Target the lots that are selling in the neighborhood, right. in the areas that are selling for twenty five to fifty, seventy five thousand dollars. Exactly. Yep. Um, okay. The next thing to sell it quick is you know hopefully you've been building an email list as leads come in. You're taking those leads and you're adding them to your email list. So you're going to send an email out to everyone on your buyers list for that state. So if you're selling a property in Colorado and you have this list in Colorado, you're going to quickly send out an email to everyone in the past that you, all the leads you've gathered to make that happen. And then you, you might even have what I call an A-level buyer. And these are people that are looking to buy multiple properties. So this isn't an end buyer that's looking to buy it to build a house on. Yeah. This is a, like an investor that's either building their own portfolio or maybe they're selling them and then flipping them themselves. But it's a buyer that will buy multiple properties from you. And they might say, hey, I'm a buyer in... Charlotte County, Florida, or I'm a buyer in Park County, Colorado. If you get a deal there, send it to me first and I'll tell you if I want to buy it. So you might have a buyer like that. You know, we've had a couple like this and it's a great way to connect uh, your the property you're buying to a buyer quickly, sometimes even before you close on it, which is exactly what happened with these two properties that we started the show off with. Uh, this guy is what I call an A-level buyer and he wanted to step in and actually just close on it himself. And that's why we're assigning it to him. Yeah. So, so that can happen as well. Um, yep. Okay. Then the, the last thing, I think this might be the last thing is owner financing. So again, this has to fit your business model that you, that you're interested in, because if all you do is owner financing, you're going to run out of capital pretty quick to buy property, but by and large, you could sell your land way faster by offer owner financing because people are just interested in that. They like I have uh, some cash deals that we've been wanting to sell for cash. And even though it's, it doesn't say anything about owner financing on any of our ads, people are calling constantly saying, hey, do you, do you offer owner financing? Is there any financing available for the lot? So if that's something you're interested in, it's going to help you sell it more quickly. Yeah, um, that's huge. Yeah. And then that's it really. So that's all I have for you on, on those tips on how to sell it fast. And like Joe mentioned, and we talked about just to reiterate, uh, don't let any of this trip you up. Use it all as a as a tool to help you and motivate you that um, you know it's going to help you avoid some things, which is also on the flip side, going to help you do a lot more right and make fewer mistakes and then just pivot whenever you encounter something and yeah. problem solve. 
But this has been helpful, Matt. Thank you so much. We need to wrap this up. Appreciate you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Joe. All right. Pleasure to be here. We'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. See ya. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching these videos. If you like my channel at all, please hit the subscribe button. Get the notification bell thing clicked so you can get notified when new videos come out. Really appreciate it. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Comment down below, all right? Thank you.